Hey everyone, I'm your host Joe Brady and we're here today to simplify. We're going to simplify light. So welcome to Portraits with Continuous Light. Now while I hadn't been a fan of continuous lights, that has changed and I'm excited to show you the results we achieved with one light. In fact, if you're just watching that trailer, you got to see some of them. We're going to do one light right here, a reflector, like you see behind me here, and our trusty Sekonic light meter. So what's our goal today? I understand that there are a lot of photographers who aren't comfortable with studio strobes or even speed lights for that matter. For those who are more comfortable relying on available or quote unquote natural light, the largest advantage it offers is, well, what you see is what you get. Now natural light is wonderful, but what do you do if the light that's available won't work for your portrait needs? To create a beautiful light where it is needed, we're going to use a very simple set today. One continuous light, one reflector. Now until very recently, continuous lights were either hot, had color spectrum problems, were very uneven, difficult to shape, or some combination of all these problems. I've started using a light that was new to me. This is the Bowens 530 stream light, and it has changed my mind about these kind of lights. Now they're not going to replace my studio strobes, but in certain circumstances, they're really a perfect solution. Let me just show you this light real quick. Now I've got one bulb on right now in the video. It's going to look really bright. In fact, maybe I'll, I'll turn off the light so you can see inside a little better. And you can see in here, it's got five tubes and you can control them on and off individually. So if I turn this light on again, that is just one bulb and there are switches on the back. I'll turn them on. It's just going to be blinding. You can see the whole thing goes white and that's a pretty decent amount of light output. In fact, that's a lot brighter than our studio lights we're using to illuminate the video. Now to make things a little even, a little more even, we've got a diffusing sock that goes over the front. And one of the things I really like about this light is it's shaped just like a beauty dish and it ends up performing just like a beauty dish. So the combination of that with this diffuser over the front of it really makes for a really nice light. You're going to see it in use. And I'm, I have to admit, I'm really impressed with it. It's a very good daylight temperature. The color spectrum is very good and I'm really happy with it. Now we're going to take a closer look at more gear, including as always my favorite little buddy here, the Sekonic 478DR light meter. But let's get started by doing some lighting tests. I'm going to use this one simple light to create a few basic lighting patterns that we're going to use during the shoot. This first step is critical towards setting the mood and creating the most flattering light for your subject. So we're going to take a little trip over to my studio and get started. Let's take a look. I just want to get the light perfectly down the center. Okay. Nice. Oh, looks into you. Should be recognizing Star Trek next. Okay. Hi, Bethany. Hello. So we're on set again, and we're going to do some little basic lighting, look at patterns and stuff. And I know you've had a lot of experience with this, but one of the things I want to delve in a little bit deeper is have you ever really taken a close look at the light in your portraits? Do you do it as well? Do you check to see, you know, when a photographer takes your picture, where the shadow breaks, what, lo what look that you like better on you, More that recently. kind of thing? Um, and as photographers, we have a tendency to, we know where we want our lights. We kind of know the look we're going for. It becomes kind of intuitive. But every face is just a little bit different. And I may like to put a light in a certain position for a short lighting pattern or, or a butterfly or a loop. But just moving that light just a little bit is going to change where the break from light to dark happens. And the position of the light, how close it is to you or how far away, is going to change how hard that transition is. We've just got one single light on the set today. That's all we're going to do. I'm using a Bowen stream light, something I really poo-pooed in the past. Do you <laughs> Try something new. Uh, I really was never a fan of continuous lights before because they were uneven, the color was bad, and finally Bones has come out with these lights and it's basically five fluorescent tubes in a kind of a thing that's like a beauty dish and I'm sure you've seen these yeah. things a lot. Typically these things had a very hot spot and then they faded off and the color was a little off. Well they fixed all that and this is the first continuous light system that I've really fallen in love with. 
So we're going to do some experimenting with it. And we're going to try some different lighting patterns, all with a single light. With any kind of lighting, whether you're doing four or six lights, or we did that four light shot mm -hmm. uh, not too long ago, with a single light, it's still the most important thing to get that main light correct. Now, you may bring in something. We're going to use a single light, but we were just playing around a little bit earlier. We're going to bring in a reflector to add a little bit of sparkle to the eye and lessen the shadows a little bit, but that is it. And what we're also going to take a closer look at today is what effect the position and the distance of the light has to the shadows on Bethany's face. And as we come in closer, what happens? You would think as closer, that's not good, but closer is a softer light because since the surface becomes larger, when it wraps around the shadow side, the transition from light to dark is gonna be gentler. If I wanna create a real hard edge, then I'll take the light and I'll move it further away and that'll create a harder edge. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a couple of basic lighting patterns and we're gonna experiment with those and then we're gonna bring in some props and have some fun. But the first part of this, we're just gonna do kind of instructional, mm -hmm. kind of demonstrate. Uh, Bethany's just gonna be static here. We're gonna have her keep the same pose and we're gonna go from a butterfly light to a loop light to a Rembrandt light. And those are just the three patterns we're gonna do with the single light and we'll talk about each one as it happens. So again, I've got my light meter. Do you have to have a light meter for this kind of shooting? Can you just use uh, your camera's live view? Like uh, I have a Sony Alpha 99 I'm shooting with. It shows me live view. It shows me what the camera settings are doing to the image. You can use that as a guideline. It'll get you very close. I don't like to be close. I like to be perfectly spot on because I don't want any variations. And when you come back, if we get, when we get up and come back and she's in a little different place, I wanna know the exact number that is illuminating her side of the face. And I may decide based on the aperture, how much depth of field I want, that I want a certain number. We'll cover that in more detail later. For now, let's just take a light meter reading. Now I'm using the 478 DR. Do you need all of its features for this kind of light? No, we're doing one thing, we're doing the ambient light mode. So basically any meter could do this. I could also do this with the 308. I'm just going to take a reading, kind of, I'm gonna do it around her eyes. And I'm at a hundredth of a second at 800 ISO, and the meter tells me F4. That's all I need to know. And this meter is also calibrated to my camera, so it knows exactly how my camera sees light. That's another advantage of stepping up to the 478. But first, let's take a look at the three basic lighting patterns we're gonna start with today. So we've got our light on the set. Again, it's a Bowen Streamlight 530. It's got five fluorescent tubes. I'm using all five of them because as bright as it looks to your eyes looking at it, it's really not that bright. We're at 800 ISO and we're still only getting F4 on her, so that's fine. First lighting pattern we're gonna do is called butterfly lighting. I've got the light kind of directly over the center of her head, up high, and you can see right under the nose, it's casting a little shadow that somebody while they were drinking, made it, thought it looked like a butterfly, I don't know. Uh, but that's what it's called. Now, typically when I'm doing this, I'd bring in a reflector to soften the shadow. But I'm going to go a little bit harsh just so the shadows show up a little stronger so you can see what we're talking about. I've also got my light stand on wheels. This is really handy for this kind of shooting because I can just drag it around the place. So I'm just going to get in position. I'm going to shoot directly in line with the light, I'm going to have Bethany move her head just so we get the perfect little shadow under the nose. Perfect. Now we're going to just move the light a little bit. The next is loop lighting, and this is something that is very common. It generally works with pretty much any kind of face. And what it's going to do is we're just going to take our butterfly lighting, move the light off center a little bit until we start to see the shadow up here just to the one side of her nose. That's where they, that's the loop of light that, or shadow that starts to occur. And it's, there's kind of a continuum between loop lighting and our third, which will be Rembrandt lighting, where loop lighting, we can start with the shadow appearing and you'll start to see a little bit of shadow on the far side of her face. As we continue to move the light around, this shadow will get longer until eventually it connects with the shadow side of her face and we get to that point, we'll be in Rembrandt lighting. So again, loop lighting can be light. So we'll do a light one, we'll do a middle one, and then we'll do just short of a Rembrandt. So let's move that light around. So look straight forward here and keep looking right here. So I'm gonna to start to move the light around just so it starts to cast a shadow 
to one side of the nose. So now you can see the shadow is extending out a little more on this side. So this is very light loop light. So let's take a look and see what we get here. It does create a little more dimension and lovely. Again, as I mentioned, this is kind of a continuum. So let's continue to go around. We'll make it a little more extreme. So now you can see that the shadow is getting longer. Still hasn't quite connected, but now you can see the shadow extending and it's starting to get close to the shadow being cast on her cheek. I'm still gonna come straight forward. Actually, turn your head this way a little bit, right there. Actually was connecting a bit. All right, and then a little bit further. And now turn your head this way a little bit, right there. And now, just by doing that, we went from loop to Rembrandt. And basically, Rembrandt is a loop light where this loop connects, and you can see we've got a triangle of light on the shadow side of the face. So those are the three lightings we're gonna do. But they're just starting points because they were kind of casting a harsh light because we're coming from so high above and it's causing some shadows around her eyes and we're not getting that sparkle in the eyes. So that's what we wanna bring back. We can do that by a combination of adjusting the height and distance of the light and bringing in a reflector. All right, before we go further, first of all, understand the images you just saw weren't really designed to be finished portraits. They were captured to simply illustrate where the light falls and what types of shadows are created. Now, before we go further, got a whole bunch of really good questions that I want to address. First of all, a couple of you asked, how do you calibrate your light meter to the camera? And that's by using what's called the Sekonic DTS software. Uh, I've, I've got videos done on that. We'll send you a link in our follow-up where you can see that. It's actually not that difficult to do. In fact, someone asked, is there a way to calibrate my camera to my, cam to my meter without purchasing what they ca characterized as that ridiculously priced calibration target? <clears throat> I know it does seem pricey, uh, but it's expensive for a reason. Actually, I'll let you in on a secret. They lose money on everyone they sell. It's an expensive to produce target. However, that said, with the latest version of the software, you don't have to get it anymore. Get yourself a color checker passport. You can calibrate the meter to the camera or the camera to the meter to using just one of these. And it's a really cool process, and it really teaches your meter exactly how your camera sees light. So you can find that on Sekonic.com. Again, we'll also include a, uh, a link to the video that I did on that. Uh, let's see, also someone asked some questions about the lights. Does it have a continuously running fan? Actually, there is no fan. The thing runs totally silent, which is really great, particularly when you're doing video. Uh, it doesn't need a fan. It, it does run silent. It also runs completely cool. It's, there's no heat, really very little coming out of this at all. In fact, on the back of the housing, after I had this thing running for an hour, you really couldn't feel it. If you grab the bulbs themselves, yeah, they start to get a little warm. But the way the system is designed, there are cooling fins in here. Uh, it really sucks up the heat, and heat is not a problem with this. Someone asked on the, the meter itself, will there be an upgrade for more zones? Well, there's nothing stopping them from adding more zones. Uh, the problem is there's no more zones to be had right now on the radio triggers. Uh, Pocket Wizards max out at four zones right now. If in the future they add more, it would be no big deal to change the software for the meter to address that. But right now, there's four zones because that's all there is. That's all the, uh, the devices that receive the signal can use. Uh, someone asked how these are different from studio lights. Well, they're continuous. Now, it looks really bright on the video. But as you're going to see when we go to do our shooting, you're going to see that we're, a lot of times I was dealing with F4, and maybe I was 800 or even 1600 ISO. The reason for that is as bright as these things seem, they're still just a fraction of the brightness, a fraction of the power of a studio strobe. Studio strobe puts out a big pulse. There's no way you're going to get F11 or F14 out of one of these things unless you have your subject have their head practically in the light. So these are great for a little bit higher ISO, something I normally don't like to do, but I found that the results with this were very good. Uh, someone also asked, can you do multiple groups with this? Sure, it's a light source. Um, you can just put multiple ones of these up and, and have at it. That's one thing I've come to learn. Uh, yes, and I'll mention the same word, I've had some prejudices about certain kinds of lights in the past. 
you really come to realize light is light. So if the light is illuminating your subject correctly, have at it. And you can treat these exactly the same way as you might other lights. You could use an umbrella mount underneath here and put an umbrella and have it going back. Nothing stopping you from doing any of that. Uh, so yes, this is an AC light. It's not a battery powered light. Uh, someone asked how, how much do they cost? I don't have the exact price. They're under $350. If you just uh, talk to your dealer or just do a Google search, I'm sure you can find it. And someone asked, can you calibrate with a gray card? And actually, you cannot calibrate with a gray card. All a gray card will do is give you a neutral. And that's an important point, and that's going to come up when we go to our other light a little bit later, which you'll see in a second, uh, an LED light. Gray cards set neutral. The problem is different light sources have different spikes and dips in color. You might find that some lights are lacking in a certain color. Maybe they're lacking magenta, which is fairly common, or they have a green spike in it. That will cause a color cast. Now, setting a neutral with your white card or your gray card isn't going to fix that. It's just going to say what neutral is. That's what the color checker passport does. By knowing what each of the values of these colors should be under a light after that neutral is calculated, it knows what has to be done to make this red, for example, come out that red. So if it means I need to add a little green or a little magenta to the image to get rid of that cast, that's what a custom camera profile does. Again, a subject for another day, but it honestly takes about 30 seconds to create one. So we'll send you the link to that, again, a subject for for further on. So we've got some more questions, but I want to continue on and then we'll come back to those. Now, the first lighting pattern that you saw, butterfly light. A great look for women. I've seen it used occasionally on men, but it's primarily a female type of lighting. Take a look at some of those great classic Hollywood portraits. You can Google those as well. You're going to notice butterfly and loop lighting is used extensively, uh, extensively rather, most frequently with a dark background that'll heighten the drama. Now, I've found that when I start running on autopilot with portrait lighting, there's a tendency to miss some fine adjustments that can really change a portrait from good to great. Moving a light just a little bit or having your subject rotate the head just a fraction can have a big effect on the look of the portrait because it's gonna change where the shadow breaks and where that transition happens. So it's important to really pay attention to what the light is doing. The light in your portrait defines the mood. It adds dimension and it says a story about the subject. It can flatter, slim, smooth features, or if you do it wrong, it can accentuate and distort them. The direction, size, and intensity of each light affects every aspect, including the overall mood. What are you going for? Intense, friendly, strong, determined, sultry, sexy. Next time you visit a museum, Spend some time looking at the light in portrait paintings. How does the light combine with the pose and expression to tell a story about the subject? In fact, if you want to play a little game, sometimes you'll come across a portrait where you get the distinct idea that the artist didn't like the subject, and they'll use these lighting elements to subtly send you that message. The shape of the face, the direction, size, and intensity of the main light define the shape of every face. Changing that size and direction of the light is going to change the amount of shadow and how gently or sharp the transition from light to dark takes place. If I'm using a light like this, the closer I get to it, the softer the transition from light to dark. If I start taking it further away, then that starts to become a hard line. Also, the relationship of the subject to the environment. When the lighting intensity and direction matches the background, the subject is anchored into that background. When the light and the background are bright, like in a high-key portrait, the effect is more ethereal and floating. When the background gets dark in relation to the subject, then lighting, the focus, becomes the face. And the eyes and the result is a more dramatic and intense portrait. So let's put some of these concepts to work and go for more dramatic lighting using the same patterns we just saw. When going to a dark or black background, Having a way to add some light to the shadow side is going to help separate the subject from that background. That adds more dimension and creates more 3D effect. The simplest way to achieve that is with a simple reflector. I've got a silver one here. With continuous lights, I prefer a silver reflector, something I don't usually like with studio strobes. The reason is the light intensity, even though it looks bright, isn't as strong as that produced by a strobe, where in that case I would probably use a white reflector. But a silver reflector works great with these lights. 
So let's head back to the studio and get more dramatic with our portraits. So now we're gonna do a little bit more dramatic lighting. We've got kind of our dark background with a little splash of color in it. We've got Bethany in black with nice makeup. And we've got just a single light that's, we're gonna start with kind of a Rembrandt lighting. Now I may decide with the light coming in this extreme in a dark background, that this side of the face is going a little too deep in the shadow. So one thing we'll add is a reflector, but let's see it both ways. And then we're gonna have some fun. I'm gonna actually put this over top of your face and see where that leads us. So I'm at 100th of a second, 400 ISO at 3.5, because that keeps that background out of focus. I don't want that to be the focus. Also, if you have, now, all right, I'm taking a look at these and they're, they're cool. Uh, tilt your head the other way, this way now. Yeah, that way, that's it. Beautiful. Except the shadow is going too deep and I'm losing light in her eyes this way. So I'm going to bring this down a little bit. because so I want to get her eyes. I want to open her eyes a little bit. So since I moved my light, I just need to re-meet her real quick. And I'm at F4 now. I moved it a little closer. I went another third of a stop. Okay, so let's try that. That's nice. Now, I like it. The eyes are now opened. However, the shadows are really deep. So we're going to bring in a reflector just to open this up a little bit. So die, if you bring that in. And again, the beauty of continuous light, bring it nice and close, is that you see it as it happens. So back off a little bit. Back off. Let's try. Let's try about two and a half feet away. And then we're going to bring it in nice and close. And you'll see the difference with just the reflector does with this light. So again, since I'm not adding light, I'm just adding light to the shadow side. This amount isn't changing, so my metering is going to stay the same. Okay, that's a little bit softer. Now take a step in, a little more, a little more. Bring the reflector towards me. Good. So now it's going to change the mood because it's opening things up a little bit. Now, Di, if you'd bring the reflector down, because I want to open up this way. See how... So we can see how the light is filling in her shadows and her eyes. So I want to get the, you can see the, the dot right in the lower corner of her eye, right there. So let's see if it right there. Beautiful, that's it. Love it. Okay, now let's have some fun. First. Actually, actually, it looks kind of creepy. <laughs> I could have told you that. <laughs> All right, let's just do it over your forehead. You need a little more white if you want to do that. That's there it. There you go. That's it. Oh, yeah, that's gorgeous. Very cool. Yeah, look like that you were just doing. Right there, that's it. Oh, that's it. Gorgeous. Bring the uh, rose up a little closer to your face and over this way. Yeah, right there. Now bring it right up, hiding your mouth with it. Down a little bit. Now put it up again underneath your left eye, right there. Nice. Okay, bring the rose down a little bit, right there. Now hold it away from you, the other side, right there. Angle it this way and bring it now the other way. Yeah, that way. All right, let's start off again with a couple of questions. Uh, first, someone asked, uh, they asked about the Color Meter 500, which is another device we're not using today that Sakonic also makes. Uh, but the question was, can you accurately measure the color temperature of fluorescence? Uh, they have some Kino flows, which are another continuous light source, and the temperature seems way off. Yeah, that can be the case. Uh, and yes, a color meter would do that. 
uh, but not everybody's gonna run out and buy a color meter. So what we did in our studio set, as I mentioned in case you missed it, was I did two things. First, I did a custom white balance. And I did that by actually taking a shot of my gray card here and getting a custom white balance in Lightroom. Then I created a custom camera profile using the color checker passport. So by doing that, it first gets a perfect white balance, then it creates a custom camera profile, which puts all the colors in the right space according to that gray. <clears throat> by doing that, the color is then perfect. I don't have to do anything else. So if I've got a light source that's got some kind of weird spike, and I'm gonna mention that a little more later, uh, if you've got a light source that is not continuous spectrum, uh, the Color Checker Passport Custom Profile will fix for that. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Someone said, okay, I mentioned that I shot some of these portraits at f4, uh, but what range can you get with these lights? Well, as with everything else, depends on one, are they all turned on? How far are they from the client? And what ISO are you going to use? Um, I think you're going to see, actually, I think there was in that session, or next week, I could be thinking next session, where I actually had these lights close enough to the subject about this far away where I was shooting at f14. So yes, you can get a lot more distance. It's just a matter of using the exposure triangle, the ISO and um, your aperture and the, uh, what's the third thing? Shutter speed, there we go, okay. Uh, let's see, so someone asked, are the pictures being shown straight out of the camera? The answer to that is no. There's a couple reasons for that. Number one, cameras by default have a tendency to be slightly desaturated and the contrast curve built into the camera is their standard on a dark portrait set to me is a little bit too heavy. I like to flatten that out a little bit. Also, I like to have a softer look on my portraits. So as, as I'll say again later, all of my portraits get, get processed and typically what I use is NYX Color Effects Pro. I use a setting called the Dynamic Skin Softener along with a couple others. Uh, I don't want to have any distractions on the face, I want to soften it. For those of you that shot film, I'm going to date myself here. I remember when I was shooting medium format film for weddings that we would take a skylight filter on the front of the camera and sometimes we'd smear Vaseline around the edges to give it kind of a soft off the edges or we'd actually take a nylon or some kind of gauze and hang it over front of the lens to get that soft effect. Now we do it in software. Okay, what else? Uh, someone asked, will the color checker passport compensate for different temperatures? And yes, it will. Uh, since you've got all the references here, you've got the grayscale, you've got the colors, it will do that. Uh, what the meter is doing is it's making sure that the exposure that all of this color temperature and white balance are being based on is perfect. It's giving me the numbers I need. Okay, so the, somebody said the metering seems to do a wonderful job on her face, but seemed to blow out the white rose. It might have looked that way on video. Understand that when we're broadcasting video, the, the, the range is very narrow as far as contrast goes. Uh, we'll post some of the images along with the recording, and you'll see that the rose is exposed perfectly. It's just the limitation of video. I don't know what monitor you're looking at, how calibrated it is. But when you look at the file, you'll see that there is detail. There is absolutely no clipping on that rose at all. Okay, so, so and last question before we continue. Uh, will Lightroom add the custom profile created with the color checker when shooting in JPEG rather than RAW? And the answer is no. Custom profiles are only for RAW files. Once you create a JPEG, you've locked in the color temperature, the contrast curve, the color space, all of that. So you got to shoot in RAW if you want to take advantage of that. So let's continue on. Let's talk about really understanding your client. And one of the advantages that I have when I photograph Bethany is that I've, been, I've known Bethany for five, more than five years. I've gotten to know her and I know her personality and what poses in light are best for her. However, when I'm photographing someone for the first time, I really have to pay closer attention to how the light shapes the face and it creates shadows. As you gain experience with this, you'll find the best light for your client a lot quicker. And this helps make the session go smoother while producing better results. Practice this, get yourself one of those white wig dummy heads and start practicing with your lighting patterns and you'll find you're able to adjust to that much quicker. Now I've got one more light to show you today. Something that I wouldn't have considered even just a few years ago. I used an LED portable battery powered light as a fill 
for an otherwise ambient light portrait session. Now, these things have been typically used by videographers for years, and I've always found them extremely annoying when I'm at a wedding and I see somebody using them. I also hated the color quality and the, just the quality of the light in general. However, once I started using this, this is the Limelight Mosaic Solo. I've changed my mind. So I guess you can teach uh, old dogs new tricks. Now, one thing you still need to know about LED lights is that the color spectrum, just the technology of this, is still a bit off. As the technology improves, they get better. But they're typically weak in magenta, and that can cause a bit of a green cast. And again, this is where having a color checker passport comes in. By creating a camera profile for this mixed with the ambient light, it recognizes those color spikes and dips and automatically corrects for them. So this allows for perfect color results from this kind of light. Oh, someone, uh, before I continue, someone also mentioned, can you use these things with strobes? The answer is yes, light is light. That said, as bright as these things look, they're nowhere near as powerful as a strobe. So you're gonna have to be careful about balancing the power. So the answer is yes, you can. Color temperature wise, they're very close to a standard strobe. I would say probably between 53 and 5500K, depending on if you have all of them turned on or not, uh, which is very close to what a strobe does. So yes, you can mix them safely. Just understand that you might wanna meter them separately so that your strobes aren't completely overpowering this. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take one last short visit back to my house. This time we're gonna set up in front of the fireplace. The mosaic solo in this case is being used to add fill light to the short side, the side away from the camera of Bethany's face. And perhaps more importantly, it adds that nice sparkling catch light to enhance Bethany's green eyes. Now, as I mentioned earlier, and I've mentioned in the past, I do prefer a softer look for most of my portraits. So I do use NYX Color Effects Pro to add those softening effects. So let's take one more short trip to finish the day's shooting. Some more flamey stuff going. I needed a photogenic fire. Okay. All right, so get where you were. So we've got our little mosaic video light here. Just using it to add some fill. I am at 1600 ISO right now at F4. because so I want her in focus. I want this to kind of be blurred in the background. I'm going to bring my shutter speed down though because I want to open up a little bit more of the ambient area around the fireplace itself. So I'm going to go to 4.5 at a 60th of a second. Can I back off on the light a little bit? Yeah, that's nice. Now turn your head more towards Diane. Still land look that way. Start to turn your head back towards me a little bit. Okay, that's it. Good. Oh, that's it. That's it. Now that's Actually, you know what? Pull the sweater off your that shoulder. So can you see why I've grown to like these little lights? Yeah, perhaps it was some prejudice on my part, but you just gotta understand that light is light. A Couple more questions, we're getting close to the end here. Let's see. Uh, someone, had, okay, so again, this is, I need to clarify this. If you're using a passport, do you set your white balance to auto? The answer to that is no, I never set my white balance to auto. When I do a custom white balance with this, that's what goes in the camera, custom. Now. That said, I do know the color temperature of these lights because I've measured it in the past. And I do know they're 5300 to 5500K. 5, so what I can tell my camera is I can tell it, just use the strobe setting, uh, the strobe icon. I recommend against using auto white balance. The reason is, is because every shot you take is gonna have a slightly different white balance. Now, if you're shooting raw, yes, you can adjust them wholesale after the fact. But I find that if you're gonna review in camera some of your images, 
that's going to influence you. So I prefer either a setting, like the strobe setting, or creating a custom white balance using one of the gray cards on the color checker. Okay, so let's see, what else do we have going on here? Oh, okay. Actually, let's continue on. <clears throat> now, so let's again, let's just talk real quick about those lights. Studio strobes, continuous light, available light, reflected light. What your job is, is to carefully watch how it illuminates your subject's face and how you can shape it to your advantage. And again, that's where my friend the light meter comes in. Now, I, a lot of you know that I shoot a camera that has the ability to have live view all the time. This is a Sony Alpha 99. It actually shows me through both the viewfinder and the LCD on the back of the camera the effects that the light has on the image. So I get to see the color temperature, kind of the exposure, but it's approximate. What this does is it tells me the real number. Now, I have an analogy that describes what a light meter brings to your photography. Let's say you're a baker. <clears throat> maybe you just simply like to bake or maybe you like to have someone bake stuff for you. When doing that, it's important to get the measurements of all the ingredients right or your results might be slightly off to anywhere to a collapsed failure. That's why you use measuring cups when you're baking. Now, of course, you might adjust the recipe to your taste, but by measuring ingredients, you're starting from a perfect mix. A light meter is photography's set of measuring cups. It measures all the ingredients perfectly and then allows you to flavor the taste. Having a light meter gives you the information you need to have to get consistent and an accurate starting point. Now, I hope today's session inspired you to try these lighting patterns. Just like the baking analogy, become comfortable with them. Then you can make them your own by adjusting to your taste. Portrait photography is all about light. And the better you get at recognizing and shaping that light to the benefit of your subject, the better the results. And as always, better results mean happy clients, and happy clients mean more business. I'd like to thank Sakonic for sponsoring us and helping us to better shape and measure light. In addition, our thanks to Bowens for these cool lights we got to play with. Now, my Sakonic meter is it's an indispensable tool in both the studio and the field. They're my measuring cups that I use when creating portraits and the results I get always make me smile. Photography is both fun and rewarding. What these tools do is help you to get past the hardware. It gets the hardware out of the way, and it lets you concentrate on creating the image that you're after. Now, we're actually going to be away for a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm going to be at WPPI next week, so if any of you are heading out to Las Vegas for that show, stop by. Uh, but stay tuned for our next session. We're going to take another approach to portraits. We're going to be looking at how lens focal length and aperture affect the mood of your portraits and how you can take advantage of these elements to get the look that really speaks to you. So that's it for today. On behalf of our crew, thank you guys for watching. Thanks for the great questions. And stay warm. Spring is coming. So until next time, keep shooting and be well. See you again soon. Bye-bye.